it is a time for questions. Uh, you may raise your hand if you have a question, and the mic will come to you. I take the chance to, to ask the question first, uh, maybe all, each of you. What is uh, the indicator, your personal indicator, when you would say that I'm happy with the, with the education? I don't know if it is not too broad, but I leave a space. Hmm? Anyone? Don't stop with me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you are still in the. Oh, yeah, I'm almost happy. Well, I think I'm happy with education when, um, when you know that when there are three parties happy. And it's children, Beautiful. and parents, and uh, educators. Because I think that, you know, and the research on emotional intelligence from last year. Harvard did a longitudinal research, and it showed we first have to be happy in order to achieve great academic results. So, you know, I go for happiness. I think that um, the main purpose of education in, in our country is to... Uh, to educate half of us, so then, then, then education is okay. Happy, confident, and competent. Um, I do have two daughters uh, who are in the early thirties, and no, I'm happy enough to have four grandchildren. The eldest one is uh, already in the school. I have been following their uh, development, their uh, relation with the school, uh, different educational um, organizations, and I think this is uh, uh, different uh, uh, in the different phases of life. And indeed, um, um, uh, until a certain point, to build up the strong. Uh, uh, mental basis, so to say, uh, is the most uh, most important thing. Uh, and uh, by that age, uh, uh, I have uh, that time focused on finding the best environment for the children, uh, for this. And then later on, when uh, um, there is another priority, um, let's say from basic um, fields of knowledge or sciences uh, have the best uh, and strongest basis then the choice should be uh, should be accordingly and also in the in the search phase but um, um, but I think really, really this um, uh, the, the, the full life and the personal uh, um, satisfaction. Uh, I mean, I'm speaking about realistic satisfaction, not um, uh, about the extreme uh, and uncontrolled happiness. Um, um, I think our society is uh, civilized enough to tolerate uh, such uh, references for the children. Well, uh, for me, education has a transformational value. So I would say that uh, I would best be satisfied with uh, an educational process when someone um, is tra uh, transforms itself and becomes better, a better person. And so uh, I would combine a transformational value also with an ethical um, component as well. So um, that would be my sum up. <laughs> I'm going to be terribly bureaucratic in my answer, and, and shall I say bureaucratic, bureaucratic in my answer, and say what makes me, what continually excites me and interests me about this world is when you see emerging developments which respond to the, to the point that Brasina made about, about, uh, about uh, this country. When you were referring to the PISA result, it showed that there was this terrible discrepancy between boys and girls. In the, in, the, in the results. When I see those countries which have, have 
the mood to address things like that, I get really impressed. And I, 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 you know, I think that something's going on there that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. Uh, and we've seen that, obviously, in Finland. Everybody knows about Finland, but uh, sorry, anything. So. But uh, of course, we love Finland, and it's always been a fascinating place to look at. But when you see others which have learned and have been able to, to move in, in the same directions, such as Poland, for example, such as Netherlands, facing challenges of having one of the largest uh, migrant communities in, 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 in Europe. They've still managed to increase their PISA scores in a way, which is not, this is not, I mean, PISA is not a box filling exercise. It means something. It doesn't always mean exactly what comes out there, but they have, you know, the Dutch know themselves that they have made some transformations in their <coughs> systems, which have meant that the long tail, which used to be there, of poor performance among boys and among their migrants, has been addressed and closed in least in part. And that's things like that make an old bureaucrat like me happy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have more questions in the audience? Meanwhile, we have many questions online. And uh, there is one that is topping uh, on the likes it has received. So uh, people were uh, giving questions online, but uh, they were also uh, putting likes uh, on the most popular questions. And one is, uh, uh, which sector of education do you think should make more effort than up to date to increase the uptake of open learning? And the question is probably to Mr. Crowley and maybe to uh, representatives of Eden as well. Well, I, I, I give a very quick, is this on? Uh, I give a quick uh, answer by saying that we, what we know least about at the European level is the vocational sector. Uh, so, I, you know, that may be uh, not the right answer because my point is we don't know much about what's going on there. It's also my sense that the kind of autonomy which has allowed universities to, um, to be, to respond pretty quickly and well to I'm not going to start again. <laughs> uh, the, the kind of autonomy which exists in universities and allow certain people in universities to grab hold of issues like that, to grab hold of the technologies and the possibilities, that doesn't seem to exist within vocational systems. Very centralised. Um, so, I mean, my, you know, in, in, in schools we know that there are individual champions among teachers who have been able to, to, to grab hold of the possibilities and, and work with those. Um, I, my guess is that the answer to that is that it's a vocational area. I'd like to know more about what's happening there, and I think the potential there. And also, given that you know we do have good links between vocational training and business, that should be and could be a driver for uh, for, for, for openness. But I don't know. Well, uh, in my opinion, all the sectors are uh, at the same level in that sense. So, all of them have specific challenges. Uh, open education, starting by higher education, of course. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, talk about uh, um, actually engaging in, in open education provision, but most of the people that are actually uh, starting those processes are not really aware of what is open education. For instance, they don't even know about the transparency element. The transparency element in the, the, in the, in the process is key, and most of the people involved don't even are aware of that. Is a typical example of uh, some of the uh, US MOOCs in which uh, uh, people try to think, well, these are open, massive online courses. Well, some of them are not massive, some are open, and not even some of them are even courses. And, uh, and we are all talking about the, the, uh, the, uh, those experiences if it was if it worked really the same. There was some um, element here uh, a while ago about the ethical standards, about the, the, tradition, the European tradition of. Uh, looking at the pedagogical value of the learning experience or, or the learning design. This is a key uh, and, uh, as well in terms of the, the, of the MOOCs. But uh, I would also uh, agree with this comment regarding GDT uh, and also school, school education as well. Um, and uh, uh, we don't know much about uh, what has been the uptake, for instance, of open and special resources uh, in the school system. There are some projects, some of them have been funded by the European Commission. Uh, but not many has been, have been quite a success in that sense. And, but we have to, uh, I would, just to sum up, the question should also uh, deal with what is actually needed to uh, disseminate open education across sectors. And this, of course, implies um, some uh, political uh, um, decision-making, of course, some uh, institutional strategy uh, as well, 
teacher training, uh, but also, very importantly, it's not being said, also the, prep the, the, the preparation of the students themselves for an uh, experience that is really different from what they used to. Thank you very much. There's another question that is uh, continuously getting more likes. It's a question to Dr. Lanziger again. Should digital education start in kindergarten? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know that I always get this question and uh, continuously, just never stops. But the thing is, I don't, I, I have moved the paradigms. I, you know, at first I would answer the question, digital education should start. The, when we talk about uh, digital education now, we have to understand that the children born today are digital natives. You know, they're, they're just different than we were. You know, I remember getting my first email. Well, they don't imagine the world without email. They think dinosaurs lived earlier than that. You know, so, so in their perception, they, they just don't. And I think every single of us who kind of thinks that way is, 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 is beyond the times and it's already outdated. You know, because the thing with the, with the children is we have to realize that um, it's not about teaching the children. It's about teaching the right use of technologies. It's about teaching to finding the right technologies. It's about finding the balance of different tools. It's about finding the information that actually matters. It's not about. Even the uh, American Association of Pediatrics three weeks ago uh, published new recommendations for the digital use because they have, they have even openly and publicly stated that those recommendations that they've had before are outdated and they should not be used anymore because they don't go hand in hand with the times. We have to understand that no matter how we idolize and wish the past was today, well, it's not going to happen. Today is today, tomorrow is tomorrow, and the children are born in a digital world, and it's probably... The second um, comment has to do with some um, criticism <laughs> that we should also take into consideration and if, uh, about the use of technology in education. There was a recent uh, publication uh, report by OECD about, for instance, exactly how uh, technology in itself doesn't solve the problems in education. And of course, um, when we uh, talk about positively about the introduction of the use of technology, it shouldn't be uh, just mixed up with some kind of a, um, pushover on the using technology at all costs. It's not that. It's uh, the difference, and that uh, report um, had also quite an uh, immediate impact because people thought, well, this is the proof that actual uh, in the end, uh, the use of technology is not so good. What actually the report states, and that is something that is an important uh, conclusion for us, is that technology is important in education when it is rightly used. And so this is a critical point. May I add something else as well? So um, I think that the gap between generations, between my generation and my daughter's generation, is the biggest ever. Because, because of uh, dig digitalization, and because of uh, uh, our children, they manage gadgets from the neighborhood. But I think it brings us to the point that um, the role of teacher has changed. Because a teacher, uh, he or she doesn't need to manage so well uh, gadgets. But the role of teacher is to bring a right content, contest, cultural content, and also moral content to all this knowledge they receive. So I think we, we should start thinking of, uh, of, of, of this. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are out of time, and we may uh, take our questions to the section.